how do we explain homosexuality in Darwinian terms if, if uh, gay people aren't uh, reproducing the way straight people do? Kin selection would be the answer I would give. It's widespread in the animal kingdom. Kin selection means you behave uh, preferentially to your relatives and uh, help them survive and thrive. And because they're your relatives and have some of your genes, if they thrive and they reproduce, then you pass on your genes through them. That's called kin selection. Like the ants that uh, bother me in my kitchen, the first ants are the scouts. And when they find food, they leave a pheromone trail as they go back to their colony so their relatives can uh, follow the trail and get to the food. Now, it turns out these scouts are sterile females. So they never reproduce directly. But you know, without them, we wouldn't have any ants. Uh, and that's a very good example of kin selection, because they uh, help the breeders breed. <laughs> and the evidence is that that's what gay people do, too. We had to go all the way to Samoa. We went to LA, and you look for kin selection, you don't find it. Then the scientists realize, oh, maybe it's because uh, gay people are driven away by their families. They have to leave their families and go to the big city, try to get lost. Maybe we should go to a culture where gay people aren't persecuted. So they went to Samoa, where the Fafaini have been a broadly accepted social class for a long, long time. If you're a Samoan kid, you hear about the, the third sex from day one. You don't hear about Adam and Eve. There is no Adam and Eve. And that's how come the Fafaini have it OK. And uh, if there is kin selection, then the Fafaini should be more altruistic in their behavior to their nephews and nieces than, than the, the straight guys uh, are. And guess what? That's exactly what they found. The Fafainis dote over their nephews and nieces, babysit for them and buy them stuff and tutor them and, of course, expose them to art and music and, uh, you know, take them to pay their medical and educational expenses and things like that. Uh, the Filipino CNA that my brothers and I found for my dying mother, who was born to be a CNA, was uh, here. He, was, he called himself third sex. He's from the Philippines and making money like crazy so he could send all his nephews and nieces to college. There was a great example of kin selection. And I heard about that, and I remember thinking, gee, that's kin selection. And that was before this paper came out. So uh, it looks as if gay people reproduce by kin selection out there in the wild. Okay. Uh, and these re same researchers decided to ask uh, these folks if they've ever experienced distress because they're so gender variant. Some of these people cross-dress and some don't. Some of the Fafaini, I think, would, we would call them trans women, and the others would be a very effeminate gay men uh, if they were here in this culture. Uh, anyway, no matter how variant these folks were, none of them uh, had any distress ever in their lives. Uh, so it looks as if all the problems that the trans people have and the gay people have is, is the result of uh, the culture surrounding them. They're suffering from a socio-cultural disorder. There's nothing intrinsic to the condition that should cause them to be distressed. So the biblical Genesis story you know, only explains the typical men and women, but the organization activation story explains everybody, in fact, all, you, all mammals. And now I just want to share with you some of the science from the recent reviews. This one by, um, oh, let's see, I think I Missed the first one. OK, this is a review by Milton Diamond. And here's the sentence from his abstract. The preponderance of evidence seems to indicate that the theory of organization activation for the development of sexual behavior is certain for non-human mammals and almost certain for mammals. He's being very, very careful. Here's Dick Schwab and his group, the leaders uh, of the brain work. And here's what they say. The fetal brain develops during the intrauterine period in the male direction through a direct action of testosterone on the developing nerve cells, or in the female direction through the absence of this hormone surge. In this way, our gender identity, the conviction of belonging to the male or female gender and sexual orientation, are programmed or organized into our brain structures when we are still in the womb. However, since sexual differentiation of the genitals takes place in the first two months of pregnancy and sexual differentiation of the brain starts in the second half of pregnancy, these two processes can be influenced independently, which may result in extreme cases in transsexuality. So we have the natural explanation for transsexuality. This also means that in the event of ambiguous sex at birth, the degree of masculinization of the genitals may not reflect the degree of masculinization of the brain. So the genitalia and what's going on in the brain don't have to correspond. And finally, this humdinger of a sentence. 
There is no indication, no indication, that social environment after birth has an effect on gender identity or sexual orientation. No indication. And uh, here we could sort of conceive of sexuality as having these three independent parameters, the body, the identity, and the orientation, and everybody would fall in their own little spot in this three-dimensional space. Now, bef before I get into what the medical profession uh, has been doing, I need to make it very clear that sex and gender are not the same thing. Sex is biological, as I have explained, but gender is cultural, and the traits of gender change with time and place. And we live in a binary gendered culture. We offer only two genders to people, only two ways you can live as a woman or a man. But many cultures recognize more than two genders. Cultures in North America, South America, Europe, Africa, Middle East, Asia. More from Asia, it's a big place. There's the uh, Polynesia, there's your Fafaini. Indonesia. Indonesia has five genders. Typical male, typical female. The third one is sort of like hermaphrodite intersex or maybe somebody very androgynous. I would probably fit in there very nicely. Uh, fourth and fifth would be uh, trans women and trans men. Those are actual genders in Indonesia. So if you're a trans person in Indonesia, you're fine because they've got a place for you in the world. So what has the medical people been doing to all of us sexually different people? Are we disordered or are we just different? Let's look at what they've been up to there in the medical world. Very quickly, in 1952 with the first uh, edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, gay people became crazy, uh, we became sociopaths. In 1968 with the second edition, we became sexual deviates. Now, there was never any evidence for any of this. Uh, 1970, the gay rights people stormed the APA convention. That's what we had to do, because it was pretty clear the psychiatrist didn't want to listen to reason. So just go storm the darn thing. And that started the ball rolling. Uh, the closest thing to science in this story was uh, 1972, where they had a panel of happy, well-adjusted homosexuals talk to the shrinks. And then we had Dr. Anonymous, who was one of their own a gay psychiatrist who had to be anonymous in order to talk to them. And then uh, a year after that, they finally wound up deleting homosexuality, although the psychoanalysts were in a snit about it. Psychoanalysts in the American Psychiatric Association. Isn't that like alchemists in the American Chemical Society? But anyway, uh, uh, oh, but you know, so they got rid of homosexuality, but you know, they replaced it with a, a uh, sexual orientation disturbance, which means that you're, uh, you're sick because you're upset about uh, the way gay people are being treated. How do you like that? And then in uh, 1980, they changed that name to egodystonic homosexuality. And by the way, notice in 1980 is when the trans people first became crazy with gender identity disorder. In 1987, they, the shrinks finally decided, oh, it's normal to not want to be persecuted. So they removed uh, the sexual orientation disturbance and homosexuality was now omitted entirely in 1987, although you were still crazy if you left America and went elsewhere in the world because the World Health Organization regarded gay people as crazy until 1990. <clears throat> when your diagnosis changes with geography, you should suspect something is a little amiss. Uh, and uh, finally in 2000, the APA came out against reparative therapies. So what's the science on sexual orientation? No indication the social environment affects sexual orientation. And the American Psychological Association last year came out saying, not only does reparative therapy not work, but it causes harm. And yet, here we have all this anti-gay quackery in the form of reparative therapy. How can you repair something that's innate, that isn't learned, isn't chosen, it cannot be undone, it's permanent, fixed, that's it. So reparative therapy is a farce. What about sexual identity? Remember how the genitalia develop early, the brain develops later, and how the environment has no effect on identity? So why are the trans people considered crazy by the American Psychiatric Association? Somebody explain that to me. What, what are you gonna do as a therapist if, if they didn't mislearn something 
if something didn't go wrong as they were growing up, what are you going to do? This is their nature. This is the way they are when they came into the world. You should accept them the way they are. Now the DSM is being revised, and guess who they have in charge of it? Reparative therapy quacks. And if Dr. Zucker, if you ask me more later, I'll be glad to tell you about the quackery that's going on in the American Psychiatric Association. What about intersex people? Remember the way the genitalia look doesn't tell you anything about their identity in the brain? And here's Curtis telling us the basic problems faced by intersex are socioculture in nature, not medical. It all comes from that current binary construct of sex and gender. And he goes on to talk about how intersex people have been subjected to genital mutilation in childhood as a result of this sexist oppression. And the genital normalization study uh, uh, surgeries continue, even though there's all this science saying it shouldn't be happening. Even John Money's own lab, in one of the rare follow-up studies of people they did surgery on who were very ambiguous, they're right here in the middle. These were all XY um, genetic male people. Uh, but it turned out, just by chance, half of them had been assigned female and the other half male. And 23% uh, of the participants were dissatisfied with that sex severity. If you include the people who didn't want to participate, which usually means they're not happy with what you did to them, uh, that figure could go as high as 50%. Uh, you can see that uh, they were not happy people. After lots of surgeries, still unhappy with their body image, still having lots of sexual function problems, the researchers never asked, what if we had done nothing? There was no controls here. The control would be to study intersex people you didn't do anything to and compare them to the people you did surgery on. Milton Diamond went to the pediatricians back in 1998. He said, you need to call a general moratorium on these sex assignment cosmetic surgeries. And don't lift the moratorium until you show that what you're doing is a good thing. And you need to undo all that uh, secrecy and shame. You need to contact your patients and tell them the truth about what happened to them. So what did the pediatricians, the good pediatricians of America and Britain do? No, no moratorium. And they paid lip service to uh, uh, doing uh, uh, studies. And uh, no, they're not going to call back these patients and tell them what happened to them, let them remain ignorant about their own medical conditions. And we'll keep doing clitoral reductions. And we'll keep turning little boys with small penises into trying to turn them into girls, et cetera, et cetera. Barbaric, not in keeping with the science. They're paying attention to things like views of the family and the parents' wishes. And, uh, the parents' wishes are often based on, I'm going to zip through some things here. The parents' wishes, uh, uh, wishes are based on their own prejudice and fears. Colombia has actually passed legislation, Colombia, South America, passed legislation giving the child at the age of five complete autonomy and taking the power of the parents away to protect the babies from the prejudice of the parents. And intersex people, now the Ameri not only the pediatricians are cashing in on intersex, but the American uh, uh, Psychiatric Association, according to the new draft of the, of the new re revision of the DSM that's coming out, uh, they're going to have a new form of gender uh, incongruence for intersex people. And gender identity disorder, they just changed the name to gender incongruence. Did they pay attention to any of the science that I've shared with you this morning? None. So where's the science? in the American Psychiatric Association. I, I don't know. I think that I have shown that discrimination against lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual, and intersex people is a socio-cultural disorder. Uh, all of these folks are natural variations. We are certainly different, but we're not disordered. Our suffering is not intrinsic to our condition. Rather, it's imposed by this binary gendered culture. The medical profession, unfortunately, has been part of this sociocultural problem, and it continues to be a problem. This scientific message about core sexuality needs to reach everyone, especially the entire medical community, educators, and parents. Core sexuality is inborn. We do not learn our core sexuality. We discover it. What we learn is whether the culture will celebrate or persecute our sexuality. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual, and intersex people suffer from a socio-cultural disorder. The culture needs to change. The culture needs to make a place for all the babies born into it. Because all of us, not just the Adams and the Eves, have the birthright to be 
who we naturally and innately are. Thank you.